السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف وجعلنا من أعوانه وأنصاره Uh, I am grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us this opportunity to witness the 36th anniversary of Islamic Revolution of Iran, which is one of the greatest blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to people of our age, to be able to witness the happening of revolution and now the 36th anniversary of the revolution is a great gift of Allah, a revolution that surprised people when it happened. And even after it happened, many people were thinking that it will only remain for three months, then they said six months, then they said nine months. So they had to extend, but they were not thinking that after 36 years, it will be in the strongest position in the last 36 years. We pray that, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would protect this revolution and, inshallah, would connect it to the coming of Imam al-Zaman at Jalallah ta'ala farajahu sharif Allahumma salli ala adwali Muhammad. Today we have been discussing different contributions of our contemporary great scholars who developed the idea of Islamic change, Islamic movement, Islamic reform in different contexts. And what I am, inshallah, going to do is to refer to the great contribution of Allama Tabatabai, rahmatullah alayhi. Uh, the people who are not very familiar with his ideas may think that he was not a person who was uh, politically minded or you know, informed. He was a person who was just focusing on his Erfan and his tafsir and philosophy. But I think that Allama Tabataba is one of the people who had greatest contribution in changing the mind of scholars and ulama in Hose al of Qom and in the whole Shia world and Islamic world. Inshallah, what I am going to share with you is the way he stressed the significance of social aspect of Islam and inshallah you will hear some passages in which he refers even to Islamic government in Al-Mizan. It's interesting that Imam Khomeini who is mainly a graduate of the Hose of Qom although he had some training in uh, Iraq but his main study took place in Qom he was sent to exile and he stayed in Najaf. So a graduate of Qom in the Hose al of Najaf developed the theory of Islamic government or Vilayat al-Faqih. Of course, this is not a new theory, but he articulated this and argued for it in the Hose of Najaf. So someone from Qom going to Najaf and develop this in a fiqhi language. And then Allama Tabatabai, a graduate of Najaf, settled in Qom, and in Qom developed this social approach to Islam. So they very much supplemented each other, helped each other, and you see the result of these two great contributions 
in the generation of scholars who had the privilege of being students of both. People like Ayatollah Mutahari, like Ayatollah Beheshti, like Ayatollah Jawadi Amoli, and so on and so forth. In these people, you see how these two beautiful contributions of these great two scholars came together, and now we have this generation of great scholars who, who are now the leading scholars of our Shia world. Allah Tabatabai in his Al Mizan, in many places he refers to the social aspect of Islam. What I am going to refer to you is mostly from volume four of Al Mizan. When he comments on the verse 200 of Surat Al Imran, you know, Surah 200 is A'udhu Billahi Min Ash-Shaytan Ar-Rajim Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sbiru wa sabiru wa rabitu wa attaqu Allah asks the believers to be patient and then wa sabiru According to Allah Metabatabai, sabiru means that you have to also be patient together you have to help each other in being patient. So it's a social exercise of patience. Esperu is personal, individual patience, but Saberu is the patience that a community needs to have. And then Varabitu. Allah says it means that you have to develop a society of faithful, a community. You have to put all the connections needed together so that you form a solid community. And then, wattaqu. Of course, you have to observe Allah's will and try to be conscious of God and aware of His pleasure. So, under this verse, verse 200 of chapter 3, in volume 4, Allah has a detailed discussion about foundations of Islamic philosophy of society and social life. And I only mention some aspects of what he mentions there, and inshallah those who are interested and can follow it up by referring to Al-Mizan uh, directly. Point number four is entitled Al-Islam wa inayatuhu bil ijtima' Islam and its interest or its attention to society. So Allah wants to explain that what is the significance of society and social life in Islam. He says that no religion and no school of thought has emphasized on society like Islam. This is very important because many people had the idea that Islam is just a religion for a person, for an individual, for your personal piety. But Allah says that not only Islam is a social life, but rather Islam is a pioneer in addressing the social nature of religion. And he says no religion has ever emphasized on the social side of human life like Islam. Al-Islam, he says, لا ريبة إن الإسلام هو الدين الوحيد الذي أسس بنيانه على الاجتماع Islam is the only religion that has made and laid its foundations on society. Sariha'an expressly this is not a matter of ijtihad this is so clear that everyone can understand islam has not neglected about any side of social life any social affair and then he says if you want to understand this better you should see how islam has provided us with rules and regulations for every aspect of human life and in the first place, social life. You see that Islam has 
clear guidance about everything that you need in social life. Whether it comes to family issues, whether it comes to business, whether it comes to dealing with other people, other nations, everything is taken care of by Islam. In page 95, Allama Tabatabai says, after referring to some other attempts and some other initiatives about social life, he says, Allah was not a person who was not aware of other religions or philosophies. You know that he has great acquaintance with different philosophies, with different religions. Even he had studied not only Abrahamic religion, he had studied you know, Hindu religion, Upanishads, everything. So when he makes this claim, it's out of acquaintance and familiarity. But he says, the very first call that has ever been made to the ear of humanity about society being an independent subject for study and attention has come from Islam and from prophet of Islam. No philosophy, no religion has ever made society an independent subject for attention and for a study. And then he mentions some of the verses of the Quran. He even has the idea that according to Islam, society is a reality by itself other than the individuals who form the society and it has its own rules and regulations. Every ummah, every nation, in addition to the individuals, has a reality. It has its own destiny. It has its own norms and laws and sunan. And inshallah, those who are interested, they can follow it. Then he says that based on this interest in society, Islam has made all the necessary arrangement. Islam has made its main and most important rulings like Hajj, like Salat, like Jihad, like Infaq, even charity on the basis of society and social life. Then how did Islam plan for implementation of these rules and regulations? This is very important. Because if you just have a theory without thinking and preparing for the implementation of that theory, it's not going to help. So what is Islamic method of making sure that these ideals will be achieved. In order to maintain these, Islam has done several things. So he mentions three points here. So please remember these three points. Mudafan ila qawal hukumat al islamiyya the first thing he mentions is Islamic government Islamic government is respected uh, sorry is expected to safeguard general instructions of religion al Islamic government is the 
government that is responsible for making sure that general framework is according to Islamic Sharia, the general framework. Islamic government is not the government that interferes in people's personal life. It's not, you know, interfering in the details, but to make sure that the general framework, the general atmosphere is according to the Islamic Sharia. And second, وَمُضَافًا إِلَىٰ فَرِيذَةَ الدَّعْوَةَ إِلَىٰ الْخَيْرِ وَالْأَمْرِ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَالنَّهْيَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ الْعَامَّةِ الْجَمِيعِ الْأُمَّةِ The second mechanism in Islam, in addition to thinking and planning for Islamic government, is to ask everyone to feel responsible to invite others towards good. As you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that وَلْتَكُنْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ From you, a community has to be formed which does several things. One is تَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ You should call towards good. You should invite yourselves, each other and other people to be doing good and also to enjoy the good and prohibit the evil. So this is also a second mechanism in Islam to make sure that people are encouraged to do good things and discouraged to do bad things. But there is something else. The next thing is this, that Islam has made it clear for its followers that the whole point in having an Islamic society, which is very important because, you know, why do you want to have a society? Why do you want to have a community? Why do you want to have a nation? You must have a purpose. Because the purpose, the end is what forms a community. Allah Taba is very clear, you know, he discusses this, that communities are formed and shaped based on a purpose, which is common, an end, which is common. For example, a group of people may form a community or a society for combating poverty, for combat, combating illiteracy. They can have different agendas. Those who think that that is something that they should dedicate their life and energy to that, come together and work together. Why in Islam we come together and form a nation? Is it because we want to rule the world? It is because we want to, for example, have more power? Is it because we want to take, you know, the property or the land of other people and add it to our own? No. According to Islam, the end is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To act as Allah's vicegerent on the earth by being the channel for the mercy of God reaching humanity and then other creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Islam has made the end, the qaraz of Islamic society Al-Sa'ad, al real happiness. Not miserable life, not a life of conflict and tension and poverty. No, real happiness and felicity. Wal-Qurb, wal-Manzal Allah. Everything is in order to reach closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be godly on the earth. We want to have godly society in which people find it easy to become good and to develop spiritually. And then Allah says that this is something that can be checked internally because Islam makes every person committed to follow this based on his responsibility and accountability before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not the power of police or the power of a, a state army that makes people interested in this. The nature of this society, the nature of this approach to social life is something that cannot be achieved Unless there is love and desire inside the person, motivation comes 
from the person. Even if people don't know about the intention, this is the person who himself or herself is aware of his intention. And he says that, You have to have an observer inside you that nothing is concealed, nothing is hidden from him. You don't need anyone from outside to tell you that you have to do this and you have not to do that. In another place, in point six, I make it shorter so that we can come to conclusion. Allama has a detailed discussion and the title is بِمَاذَا يَتَكَوَّنُ وَيَعِيشْ الْإِجْتِمَاعُ الْإِسْلَامِ What are the things that make and form Islamic society, an Islamic society. One of the things that he mentions here is that for Islam, the purpose, the end is not only worldly life. In many other attitudes towards social life, whether it's in the form of politics or whatever, the focus is only to improve the condition of worldly life. Al-hayat al dunyawiya al-hayat al tabiiya That's the main concern or the only concern. The, the maximum they want is food, shelter, health for people. But Islam, in addition to all these things, Islam, in addition to planning and providing practical measures for securing these basic needs, but Islam says these are only basic needs. We have something greater to achieve. So according to Islam, there is a higher form of life compared to which this worldly life is like no life. The real life is the spiritual life. The real life is the life which is in the akhirah, in the form of heavenly life, and in dunya, in the form of al-hayatu tayyibah. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, inna dar al-akhirah lahi al If you want real life, that's the life of heaven. If in this dunya you want real life, that is hayat tayyibah, which is a simple, Example of heavenly life in dunya. So, Islam wants us to achieve that life of piety, that life of closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that life of purity and innocence. I am saying this because later I want to say what is the difference between this approach to politics and what we see in some parts of Muslim world, which is totally different from this way of looking at politics. So Allah says that Islam is inviting to another life. لكن الإسلام لما كان يرى أن الحياة الإنسانية أوسع مدارا من الحياة الدنيا المادية. The real life for human beings is much more expanded than just the physical life. بل في مدار حياته الحياة الأخرية. Rather, in Islamic understanding of hayat, the worldly life is like nothing, very little. That real life that we are trying to achieve needs المعارف الإلهية. Needs to have. Very good understanding of your position in this world. To know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to know yourself, to know your relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the rest of the world. You need these ma'arif. It's a matter of understanding and ma'arifah. And these ma'arif cannot be achieved and preserved and absorbed except with akhlaq. It's very beautiful. Ma'arif is something that you cannot gain it just by reading and studying. The real ma'arif, the real understanding of Islam comes by practicing Islamic values, 
and being pious. Yara, he means Islam. Yara anna hadhi al ma'arif la tanhafidu illa bi makarim al akhlaq wa taharat al nafs min kull al radhila. If you want to achieve and maintain these teachings of Islam, you have to be a virtuous person. You have to be a pious person. Otherwise, you cannot expect to understand Islam properly. And then he says that Wayara Annahadhil Hakaiq La Tatim Wala Takmul Illa Bihayatin Ichtimayatin Saliha Mu'tamedatin ala ibadatillah subhanah. And these cannot be achieved. You cannot have proper ma'arif and virtuous character unless you are given the blessing of living in a society of pious people, like-minded people, people who support each other, advise each other to observe the truth and virtues. Everyone tries to treat other people based on social justice and equity. And then he mentions again here, what are the ways of implementation this? The sanction for implementation of this view is is first the responsibility of Islamic government. ثم في أهدة المجتمع ثانيا. Then it's the responsibility of the community, of the society, of the believers. So, what I wanted to say is that according to Allama Tabatabai rahmatullah alayhi, and then you see this is followed by many of his great students like Ayatollah Mutahari, they believe that Islam is a religion which is social by its nature. It's not that Islam has personal side and social side. It's, Islam is a social religion, although it deals with the personal side. But the main focus is on the social life of human beings. And this social life is well regulated by Islam. Islam has not kept silent about this or has not, you know, showed you know little interest to this islam has undertaken to provide us with everything that we need in order to have that ideal social life but this is something which cannot be coming from the top this is not something which can not which can be forced by power this is something which must start from every person's heart Unfortunately, some people think that Islamic government is something that you force on non-Muslims, for example. If you have, you know, for example, a Muslim majority, they want to force their way of governing a country on people. No. When we say everyone is free to choose his religion, la ikraha fi din for sure, it means that also we are not able to say that Islam is forcing its social life on other people, let alone its politics or governance on other people. It comes from within. Islam says, yes, I have planned for you if you like to follow. I have planned for your personal life, but more importantly, I have planned for your social life. Do you like it? You are welcome. If you don't like it, then it's your decision and you have to be accountable for your decision before God, before yourself, before your children, before the history. But no one is going to force you in this world. It's a responsible choice that every person, every society has to make. There is no pressure. And actually, the nature is the nature that pressure doesn't work. Because as we said, the core of this is what? Is god wariness. The core of it is what? Is piety and purity. Can you force people to be pious and pure? 
You can, you know, close someone's eyes so that he doesn't look at, you know, sinful sins. But you are not making that person pious. You can, you know, keep away alcohol from someone's mouth so that he doesn't drink alcohol. But you are not making that person pious. Pious is something that can only be achieved when people are able to free, ch freely choose between what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is bad. And then the decision comes from within, not from without. So, Islam has plan for everyone who wants to follow. I think actually most of Islamic plan for social life is able to be translated into a language that people across religions and traditions can accept. Unfortunately, sometimes we only use the language and the discourse of fiqh, then we think that it's only for Muslims. But if you use the language of philosophy and morality, you would see that great part of Islamic plan for life is something that everyone can welcome. Every person of goodwill and moral consciousness can welcome because Islam wants us in the first place to do what? To do good. Is this something that only Muslims can welcome? I think this is that everyone can welcome. What was Rasulullah suggesting to people? Rasulullah was liberating people. This is something that everyone welcomes. Who is in the world who says that I don't want to be liberated? This is something that everyone likes to be encouraged to do goodly things, to be encouraged to do pleasant things, to be discouraged to do bad things. So, Islamic plan can be translated into a language that can very well communicate to mind and heart of non-Muslims. But everything at the end of the day is the choice of people. Whether they want to have virtuous life or not, it's their choice. And you cannot be virtuous unless you choose to be virtuous. Unless you want to be virtuous. And I would like to end with a quick reference to what Imam Khomeini rahmatullah alayh, after coming to power showed. Because there are many things that you may say before you have power. But when you have power, you know, sometimes you may think that there are exceptions to a law, there are changes. But to understand the difference between this approach and some other approaches to Islamic state, you know, Islamic, I don't know, uh, government that we see in some parts of the Muslim world to understand the difference and the contrast you have to remember a few things one is that this approach is based on real scholarship this is not what you know few unknown people who have no history no background all of a sudden call themselves you know mufti or you know imam or khalifa or amir and they say this is the view which is based on a scholarship. A few decades of the individuals, but few centuries as collective scholarship. It's a big difference. When something is said by a great marja or a great philosopher or great mystic like Allama Tabatabai or Imam Khomeini is based on a scholarship. They have already taken into account all different aspects of the subject. When they say something, they know what they mean, and they know how to argue for it, and they know what are the implications. This is the first point. The second thing is that this idea is based also on many years of self-purification. Both Allah Tabatabai and Imam Khomeini are the people that we look at them not just as scholars, although they are great scholars, but we don't look at them just as great scholars. We look at them as role models, as examples for that virtuous life that we are seeking. These are the people that for many years struggled hard to remove anything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from their heart. So there is no list of anything worldly or selfish or ego 
when they think, when they teach, and when they try to implement. And the third thing is the way they acted. You see, the difference between the example of Islamic revolution in Iran and in some other parts of the world. In some other parts of the world, you know, when they wanted, for example, to establish Islamic State, which is not yet formed, you see what they do with their opponents, what they do with their fellow Muslim brothers and sisters, what they do with people of other faith, what they do with their prisoners, and so on and so forth. And still they don't have power. Still they are not recognized. When they do such things in this situation, you don't know what they are going to do if they are recognized as an independent state. But when Islamic government was formed in Iran, the experience was totally different. In Iran, Imam Khomeini didn't say because 99% of people are Muslims, we are going to make life difficult for non-Muslims. Indeed, for the first time in the history of Iran, religious minorities were given their rights in the Constitution. Never in the history of Islam, Armenians, Assyrians, Jews, and Zoroastrians were recognized in the Constitution, even in the time of last regime, although they were not Islamic, but there was no recognized right for them in the Constitution. If you ask, for example, you know, Armenians, Assyrians, you see they are very happy because right at the beginning, their rights were recognized. They were given fixed seats in the parliament. It's very important, fixed seats. People may not understand what does it mean. You know, we have a quota system. Every town, depending on the population, has few seats in the parliament. And of course, these are now not able to increase because then we are going to have thousands of representatives. For example, Tehran has 30 seats. What does it mean? It means that people of Tehran should go and vote and choose up to 30 people as the representatives. According to Islamic Revolution Constitution or Islamic Republic Constitution, not only a non-Muslim can nominate himself or nominate a non-Muslim, not only you can vote for them, but in order to make sure that they would be able to be elected when there is a big majority of Muslims, their seats are fixed. Because, for example, if in Tehran, the Armenians were going to vote for themselves, they didn't have chance of having an Armenian elected because great majority are not Armenians. Yes, maybe Muslims are voting for them, but the Constitution says we don't want to leave it to the mercy of people. We want presentation, representation of these people. So they have been given fixed seats and they only compete between themselves. Because if they wanted to compete with the majority, the chance was very low. So they have fixed seats in the parliament. They can follow their own rulings when it comes to marriage, when it comes to divorce, to inheritance. All their personal rulings is according to their own sharia. They have choice. Yet they can go to courts of the state. They can go to their own system. Imam Khomeini, right from the beginning, every year was giving Christmas message to Christians. Even sometimes today people are wondering, should we say congratulations to our Christian friends or not? But Imam Khomeini, as a great marja, from the beginning, every year was sending a nice message to Christians. So I don't have time to go to detail to say that this model of Islam is totally different from what we see in some parts of the world as Islamic state or Islamic government or Islamic politics. I think this is a model which is a great achievement of all humanity and I think it's a result of maturity of us in reaching this point where we can put together 
personal life, social life, worldly affairs, religious affairs, role of people, democracy, Islamic ruling, everything together. This is the model that I think needs more scholarly attention, needs more representation in universities, in departments, and I think everyone who really knows what is the model would find that this is a good model. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us in, in showing our great appreciation and gratitude to all his blessings, especially very special blessings that he has blessed people of our generation. We are the generation that Allah has blessed them a lot. In our life, we have seen many great things happening. We have seen many great personalities. And we have to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have to make sure that we fulfill our responsibilities towards these blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen.